Well, welcome in everyone to Diffuse, the podcast where we talk about gaming, gaming issues, and gaming technologies. Today, or this week rather, we're going to be talking about the state of gaming news, gaming conventions, and what's going on in the space that surrounds gaming that is not the games itself. Um, this week I am joined with Fortnite and something barbaric, and we're just going to start it off with the big news that kind of launched me down this rabbit hole, and that's the news that E3 is canceled, and because it got canceled this year, I don't think they ever come back from it. Um, essentially, they said they were going to plan it. Sony... Microsoft and Nintendo all said we're out. Activision followed suit with those three and they just fell through because they didn't get the response they wanted and I don't think they're going to be able to turn it around to come back next year or in the future. What are your guys' thoughts on it? I am not a gaming convention kind of guy. I generally get my news by watching people play games on Twitch or uh, linking to a YouTube video for information or gameplay on stuff but i usually try to form my own opinions and i don't particularly like uh game related game shows or uh, not game shows um tv conventions or oh. news or anything like that because it usually is overhyped and uh, it's a lot of lies and i, I don't know like look at this game that's uh, you know eight nine years from uh, being available yeah so, it's I mean, that's the timeline sometimes. Court, are you sad to see it go? No. Not because, even a little nostalgia. Well, I was never a big E3 person myself, but we haven't actually lost it. I realize that sounds like a really youtube way to start a sentence, because that seems like a cold open. <laughs> um, the reason why I say that is a couple of things. I think that the catalyst for E3, E3 was already starting to lose steam pre-COVID. Going into COVID, yeah. But they could have survived. What really killed them off was COVID. Not for attendance or numbers, because look, SDCC is still a thing. Like these, There are huge conventions that are still going on. Here in the UK, I just went to a convention called WASD, W-A-S-D, mm -hmm. gaming convention, uh, EGX huge huge gaming convention there's also uh comic cons and there are um there are tech conventions the publisher um, conventions no just just general conventions yeah. that well that i was adding to it <laughs> oh oh i see i thought it was a question my bad um e3 fulfill the space in the market that is n that no longer needs to be filled e3 is is uh, an amalgamation a, a a large was a large behemoth of a, an amalgamation that cost way too much to exhibit at was very hard to get into and generally what's happened since covid is covid what covid did was make um tech companies like gaming companies for example we're going to stick with gaming you know, like, let's say PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox, they all develop their own directs and realize that it's far right. cheaper and they already have a captive audience and a wider net audience that will generally gravitate towards them directly rather than the need of a what would have been kind of free to mid internet era showcase, which costs far too much to exhibit at. And they can still do that at these smaller conventions that cost less, that are more local. Like, for example, here in the UK, we have EGX. That's the biggest one in the UK for the year, generally. It's a much smaller convention. They can show off the, the titles that they want to show off. The Game Awards is still something to show larger titles to a wider audience. So why do they need to exhibit something that is not showing off their product directly when they yeah. can do it themselves? And they I mean, have... I I guess for me, like, I do love the nostalgia of it. Like, I grew up, because before all the smaller conventions that we're talking about and the more niche and more specialized conventions existed, there was E3. 
And like you said, there was that gap in the market. And it became this thing where I always looked forward to E3 would happen. And I knew for the next two weeks, I would get flooded with content about stuff I didn't know about or what was going on. And I loved that idea or notion of that going on. So I miss E3 for that. And I do understand that there are other routes and aspects that are involved in it. And I, I'd like some of the things, but the fact that it was so consolidated in such a wide net, I think I'll always miss it because because I loved that large sweeping net that had so much involved. And yeah, I think, I, I think the nostalgia has a big part of it. Right. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I think I would normally be sad to see it go. If there weren't things that were already replacing it and had already replaced it for nerd culture and movies and games to a degree, you still have Comic-Con and yeah. then you, you still have your, your game release exhibitions with the direct and small and smaller, more local or national shows, which is still exhibits, which cost less than half the price. You know, they're not extortionate to go to. You don't have to generally fly to get there and you can get more hands on with certain elements and certain tech and certain games. Um, talk to developers, whether that's a triple A developer. And then also, you know, you have things like the game awards, which kind of, it's a celebration of gaming, which also encompasses releases. So if a, if a developer wanted to show off or release something, they could do it that way as well. But from a company's point of view, nowadays, because we have so much, so much of a footprint on the internet, and that has directly contributed to print media, and it's such a big industry in, 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 in of itself now, and there's not that much comp like there's not that much competition. You're not seeing a new or a different console come out. It's generally the big three. So well, so that's actually changing now with uh, Asus, Rogue, and Steam Deck. So like there are people that are trying to force their way into the console console PC bridge, which is pretty exciting. But that's pretty quiet in gaming news in general. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the game awards kind of replacing a large segment of what E3 did, which is the game trailers and publishers getting out there for stuff like that. I mean, we saw it last year at the game awards. They pushed the steam deck, like everyone in their, like they had a hundred thousand to give out. It felt like, like every break they took, they were talking about the steam deck. It was like Oprah. You get a steam deck. You get a steam <laughs> Everybody deck. Everybody gets a steam deck. <laughs> But I have this like love hate with the game awards because I hate the principle of the game awards because of how it's treated and kind of, I guess, the behind the scenes politics of the game awards. Mm -hmm. But I love that they have the sharing of new trailers that people can get out in the game awards, which is why I loved E3 because you didn't have a lot of that background of you have to believe that this was the best game last year because we told you. I don't care about that. Like they're going to go the way they go. I don't think they listen to fans as much as they should in those award shows. E3 was all of the news without all of the drama around the awards. So it, it's hard for me to let that fill a gap. If that makes sense. I don't even know if you agree about the awards necessarily. Like everyone wants an award, but it's, I think it's, it's really I like, hard I like, how they do it. I mean, the thing is, is the the awards means okay. So if if there's an award that's being given out, it generally means like that company, that publisher or developer will be able to. They're more likely to get grants, more likely to get funding from uh, outside sources. It, it's a it's more of an act of faith. It's less to do with the the award itself and more to do with what it can do for them moving forward so like let's say what who's your favorite developer do you have one oh i i don't think i have a favorite developer 
I mean, there's some that I pay more attention to because I like some of their older games like Rockstar or Bethesda. I mean, the big ones that made the games that anchored my childhood. Mm -hmm. But like, I wouldn't say I have a favorite because they all have disappointments and hits and Okay, so I'm not fiercely loyal to anyone, I guess. Other than the company I work for, the developer that I work for, um, the one that I feel has produced the best games, the games that I've enjoyed the most, and the way they operate is Coffee Stain. It's probably why I mention them so much, because right. the way that they operate, the way that they communicate, the games that they release are generally solid. And let's say those, as a mid-tier developer and publisher, their developer and publisher, if they won a, a game award for their game, that's not just a crest that they can put on like a poster or a Steam page. It also means that they're more likely to get investment elsewhere so they could hire in more people so that they could make larger games or make more games or, you know, it, it, it's essentially a, a way of kind of showing off in the industry, but also an opportunity. Um, you know, like it's like athletes, I guess. Athletes yeah. that would go to the Olympics. The Olympics isn't actually the biggest part of it because they don't get paid for it. But what it does if they win is it's they're more likely to get sponsorships or um, yeah. exposure or work after the fact, you know, within their respective fields and outside of it. Yeah. And like, I, I get that to a degree, but I just feel like sometimes when I watch the game awards, I already look at it and it's, it's one of those things where, and we talked about it during our watch party last year with, soul strike we looked at it and we're like man i really loved this game for game of the year i think this actually is the game of the year but we all know this game's going to get it like it's one of those things where we look at it and we see the awards and it's like we all kind of agree that like we think this is the best game for that but we know that this other game's going to get it because of the behind the scenes stuff and mm -hmm. like you're not going to have that in the Olympics or with professional athletes like to a certain degree, their merit and effort have to outperform and it's not subjective the way the awards are. So it's incredibly political. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you hear throughout the industry and you, you I'm not going to repeat any of it, um, but the, you realize how political it can be much like any other industry. Um, and I think that because I, as gamers, and I, I, I think I've got quite a, a, a unique view in a lot of ways where I've done this for a while now as a streamer and as a gamer, and I've had the opportunity you know, to now move into the industry, and I, I'm already seeing it in a very different way. You know, it's kind yeah. of, it, it kind of opens your eyes a little bit because there's, there's what you see as a final product what you see behind the scenes is just drawing that curtain back and i'm just peeking right now but it's interesting to already see a lot of that happening um and you know pay no I, attention to the awards behind the curtain <laughs> pretty much like okay so like is it the oscars that has the the uh, you campaign for your movie i so believe so where like you send out your submission and it's what people you reach out to to help try to secure votes. I I think I remember that kind you know, of. Just, not you just know, I, I, Wait, you know, I don't Mark? actually know anyone named Oscar. Never heard of him. Never, never met a single Oscar. And this is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know. Like the the politics, the politics of the awards aside. I do like that they have that aspect that they're carrying on from E3. But it also forces us down this rabbit hole where there's a lot more publisher conventions. And to a degree, publishers are releasing information more direct to the consumers because mm -hmm. of the loss of... I mean, it was a titan in the space forever. But... I don't, I just, I guess it's me and the nostalgia I hold for it that I wanted the consolidated point. The game awards is a consolidated point and a lot of the smaller condition 
conventions that are kind of in their place now mm -hmm. are more niche down and i don't know about all did you ever go to an e3 did it just rub it in no i always wanted to but like so once i started tracking e3s was kind of in the height of my military and in the military you're not going to get time off for stuff like that they just no. they don't care <laughs> and then by the time i got out of the military boom covid and now it's dead so it's one of those like it's almost a bucket list thing that i can never achieve my my, my without trying to like gotcha you uh, my point is is what's the difference like you saying it's a consolidated point and i understand that and i and i get that and i i i, I understand the point that you're trying to make with again the nostalgia makes sense you know you followed this for so long but what information or what yeah what information are you missing from having direct and smaller conventions because like if you wanted to go to e there are those smaller conventions where you can get hands you still have packs Pax right. is massive if you want to go and get hands on a game from different publishers different developers you can do that at Pax. equally as large they just don't have that side of it that is a um, a public televised streamed, which they probably do actually have streams of it, but not yeah. in the same way. You have the Game Awards, which it, celebrates gaming, at, in, you know, as an award show, but then also shows new releases, and then you also have the direct. I, I, I my, I, I think the yeah, you're right. It's not as consolidated as it was, but having more direct, like direct communication. It makes it yeah, a lot more nimble. Themselves. You get faster yeah. access. I, I you do get more agree of it. with that. You get more um, of it. I guess, like, for me, it it's that consolidation. How I consumed the content is so much different. Because when E3 was going on, on Xbox, they had an E3 channel. This is the news from E3 today, everything that we saw. And then you had YouTube that had several channels covering the news of the day. And then at the end of the week, that was E3, you had the consolidated best survival games announced at E3, best horror games announced at E3. So that consolidated content, I feel like doesn't exist anymore because the convention itself doesn't exist anymore. And you're right, all the information is out there and it's more direct. And some people do content like that for the video game award trailers, but you're not getting that same level and design of content anymore because that convention has been removed out of the way. And I guess I I could be wrong on on that if I haven't seen that from other conventions. And again, that may be because I don't know as about as many of the other conventions. Does that make sense? Cause I almost feel like in that regard, it's not about the convention itself. It's about the content that was spun off and tailored to the convention or because of the convention. For me, what I'm hearing, and again, <laughs> I could be wrong. I, I could be massively wrong. You're but hearing that I'm like... lazy. It's okay. <laughs> to, to a degree, and not you, what I'm hearing is not so much laziness. Accessibility is what I'm hearing. How accessible right. that one consolidated show was. But when, I, when, again, just to counterpoint that, the accessibility is far greater than it ever has been. It's just segmented a little bit more. Yeah. And I don't actually think that's a bad thing because with like let's say E3 or when we did the reaction show with the Game Awards, it was very much like a lot of information from a lot of different companies um, all at the same time. Whereas now, I feel like we, you know, you, you can have like the PlayStation state of play in what, like February, I don't know when it is, let's say February. You can have Nintendo Direct in October. You can have Xbox, whatever they call it, um, the Xbox gate in, <laughs> in August, you know what I mean? So there's like little, there's smaller things to look forward to. It's not so much of a big event. And then if you do want 
the you know a more consolidated thing you do have the game awards and then you have but i I would say it's more accessible because of the nature of the all of those now being at your fingertips they're being streamed um i would say if it was a case of going to these conventions and being within that atmosphere you know maybe cosplaying or the hands-on the the hands-on approach i would very much have a more of an understanding for that but considering your this sounds like a personal attack considering your position on it where you haven't had the chance to go feel attacked uh, yeah, shouldn't, it shouldn't. It's, I'm, yeah, you shouldn't. <laughs> it's more of a generalization i get yeah. that i'm just the example i mean we're the point counterpoint right surprise barbarian hasn't chimed in to wage war on me as well but <laughs> yeah what bob Eric, what's your what's, what's your what's your opinion on this i plead the fifth <laughs> <laughs> Any other time he's first in line to to tee up against me. <laughs> I I don't feel the need. Uh, court court's taken it. <laughs> I I defer to the master. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, your stream wife has the uh, the floor. I I think I think I see it differently. I've you know this year alone I've been to two. Right. And moving into the next year or so, I'll be going to a lot more. You know that's. Part right. Of my well, job, which we is don't cool all I... have fancy jobs that tell us to go and put us up on per diem. And <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, pretty hot. I'm pretty hot stuff. Uh, I don't no. know if you do, but I'm a big deal. <laughs> but if, what I'm saying is, if the opportunity to go to one of these things was there, they they do exist. And uh, like I said, yeah. convention the size of, and you never know. Packs could, in some ways turn into e3 they, there could be a, a change in there but right. i think i just think a lot of companies realize I, that, that they don't need that anymore for one you know pre-internet there was nothing else e3 oh yeah w- was was one of the only places that you could show off because you know it, th- there was so much noise in an analog world you know a s- slowly evolving digital world now we are within this synthesized digital so realm interconnected and I yeah. think that's a huge thing that specifically almost amplified in gamer culture is I think like gaming news is probably some of the faster moving news because if you really think about it, we sit down and we play with our friends online and we kind of BS. But like if one person in your friend group hears about this story, you're going to hear about it. And then this person hears about it. We spend so much time online interacting with each other that news spreads very quickly throughout the gaming world. And the fact that companies are leaning into the direct to consumer launches like game trailers coming out straight to YouTube and stuff like that. It's exciting. And if any community could capitalize on it, it is the gaming community. But that process, I feel, also takes away a lot of comparative in new launches and news. Like, everything gets split up into single segments instead of compared to the rest of the genre or stuff like that. I don't think I understand your point. Well, no, I'm, <laughs> that's, I, I don't know that I understand my point. No, I'm, I'm saying that, like, you're right. Companies are leaning into the ability to get the information straight to the consumer. Mm. And in the gaming world, because of how much time we spend online talking to each other, that information spreads very quickly, which is to the advantage of companies that want to give that information straight to us. But in doing that, we've lost a bit of the segment where when you're especially in the world of like launches announces trailers Mm. because they're going straight to the consumer they don't have to stand out against five other people in their genre they can pick a time where it's only them and they get all the focus which is good for them in that game but you don't get to hold it up against anything necessarily side by side well, I don't think that's true. You know, the fact that we do, like, I'm going to refer to the Game Awards yet again. Something like that, where the most pertinent games 
will be shown, which is what generally happens at E3 anyway. Right. Th- there are, you know, like we, we did a rea- whole reaction thing with, do you remember when Gollum got shown and we'd just been shown a Hellblade? You know, mm-hmm. like there was yes. a direct comparison there. We'd just seen somebody fight, a ma- I think it was Hellblade, a um, huge giant, you know, uh, that was an epic trailer. And then we have Gollum. We're like, what, why would, why would they make that? Why would, why do we care about Gollum? <laughs> you know, I, I still think there's space for it. I do. And then don't forget, we still have SD, which I believe has a lot of that as well. You know, possibly not as much in the, the games sphere, but there's still an element of that. And I think, from my point of view, the way that they run the PlayStation State of Play, like in COVID, it was different because it was just all online. But the fact that they will have audiences outside of that. So like, you know, if if they do the PlayStation State of Play and they have like a new console to release, they will do it in front of an audience. You know, so you're not missing that live element. And there's going to be games that are on those singular platforms or or released, you know, as as exclusives or, you know, that you can can have a comparison to each and each and it's, you know, in itself. But I think also... Other than Nintendo, because Nintendo are kind of like, well, they're Nintendo. Um, <laughs> they're different on so many levels. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, it's kind of a bit like, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like polygamy. You know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> all right, so your PlayStation exclusives. Aren't that yeah. the, all it means is it's not going to be released for a couple of years or a year, and then it's out on PC. PC. Then it's yeah. out on possibly Xbox. the the, the games world now went from mono like mono titles, mono release titles, right to now being a lot more interconnected with each other. So it's really like, what's your preference of 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 pla- platform or pla- you know preference of play? Yeah. No, no, I get that, yeah, because, like, Nintendo, you're not going to get on anything but Nintendo, but all the other things outside of Nintendo's ecosystem is probably going to show up absolutely everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like I say, Nintendo's on their own. Like, I, I, I want to play Mario Kart with Soul. I have to get it on the Switch. Yeah, there's Otherwise, no other way. I, there's no other way. Um, whereas if I want to play... Let's say Sea of Thieves, play it with anyone. It's cross play. Yeah. You know, and so cross I think, platform is becoming way more popular. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, having these companies doing their own directs, it shows it's, it get, we get to see what they have been working on specifically. And then at the end of the year or the start of the year, I guess, we get an amalgamation of that year which is a celebration of gaming, and we get to see that, that collective together, like we would at E3. Right. But if, let's say, for example, there is a game that you want to know more about. You can have a lot more time learning about that game on a direct than just showing a trailer and, and kind of then moving on to the next thing because there's not enough time to fill, to fill it, you know? Right, because not... the schedule of E3 is, I mean, it was always tight like people did not get a massive amount of time that's a fair counterpoint or a fair point and the cost of it would have been like it, it was the super bowl yeah of, of tech. and like trying to get a spot on there like you would have to really have to have a a good amount of money to be shown on there you know to be so su- so almost like it was it became too big to be sustainable yeah, Is well, that... I mean, they they the problem the problem with E3 and this was their biggest their biggest issue is they relied not on not on a collection of of smaller, you know, exhibitors or they only relied on the big boys. That was their investment model. You know, right. PlayStation so when, X- like this last year the big 3 plus Activision said we're not showing up, there's nothing to bolster the the foundation of it and that goes kind of directly against their initial ethos right if e3 was to survive again 
they would have to go back to the model that they once held, which is the things you haven't heard of yet. Haven't the things heard that of. are under the surface. Yeah, PC culture and, and and tech culture when it first started was was an underdog. No, it wasn't it's not it wasn't as as mainstream as it was today. It was a subculture. You know? Right. If you said you were a gamer, like you just think of this well, it was like, you a think subculture of, gaming, of a subculture. Right? You think of you yeah, you think of gaming now. If you think of a gamer and you say what's the stereotype of gaming, you are probably like thinking of a stereotype that it's at least 30 years old. That still stands today, but that's a 30 year old stereotype. That was a stereotype yeah. from back then, you know? Yeah. Um, and probably somewhat of a reality. Now the, you could The chubby tell me, mom's basement. Like South Park. everyone at the South Park guy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Every everyone knows that. But like where where gaming is now, it's so vastly different. And and so you couldn't tell me a stereotype for that, you know? You you just it, 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 cause it's anyone. It's anyone and everyone. Um, right. But the thing is, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, which is you try and please everyone, you know? And then when it gets to when it gets because then they have no they have no real niche. There's no diversity or diversification even in what they're presenting The, you know, if, if there's a business where somebody goes, I can do that or I can do that better or I can do that on my own. Then your business is is null and a lot of businesses go that way, you know. There, there's part of me that wants to be the old curmudgeon where this is how we got the news forever and these kids just need to accept the way that this is how we get news and information and they need to keep it going. But there is the realistic part of me that is, I do get information faster. It is more direct and companies aren't going to stop having their own thing. So I have to come on board and find a new way like essentially I know I have to change the way I intake the content and consume it from the way I did it during E3, but I don't want to. <laughs> you you want to know something that I miss and I wish was more readily available in games. And What's it's that? kind of, it's kind of difficult with where we are with, let's say more of a live service culture. It's cheat codes, man. I miss cheat codes. Right. And, and this is related as well because like i i spent a lot of time when i worked at gun counters and everything mm -hmm. staring at magazine racks to get information out of okay. magazines and reviews I was, I was thinking you're like but but the, the when i magazines. when i was watching no the ones you read they have pictures and and articles mm -hmm. but when i was staring at those it didn't seem like there was many gaming magazines as there used to be when I was a kid and like I remember when gaming magazines used to have the demo disc you'd get a demo uh, disc yeah. with like six games on it that just had a demo or you know they had the cheat code section or the like record sections right and like some of that is I mean you talk about ultra nostalgic like cheat codes some of that's not there anymore like mm -hmm. none of that's probably ever coming back because steam replaced it right so like you can get a lot of news and demos off of steam now so that segment's kind of gone and everything in the gaming world is being pushed online and direct to consumer and that coupled with again how much gamers talk about gaming it just makes the whole news ecosystem of gaming so different than even the what 2010 right it's funny that you mention it because retro gaming and i hate to say that the playstation is retro but it is now um and that's just a personal thing because i'm like i'm not that old but we grew up with it it, it can't I'm be a, I, it's not yeah. possible <laughs> you said it wouldn't happen to me we had a deal um you know that's booming at the moment you know whereas a PlayStation 1, five to ten years ago, would have cost you, well, like, 20 quid at most with controllers and games. 
now if you well at least in the where i live in the you know mm. you go into like a, a trading shop they're they're re, they're going for like 50 quid and that's just for the console you know right so i think there is there's a market for nostalgia i, I mean there always e3, will be like I, I i think just to relate it back to e3 i think if e3 is going to survive they have to niche down. They have to, they have to go back to the drawing board and go, why did we fail? And they could just go, ah, well, it was COVID. But there is something, there is something of value that people weren't getting. They weren't finding the value in E3 anymore. And the direct, quite a new thing. So if this was happening pre-COVID, what was it that was the driving force for negative you know the negation of numbers and the attrition of paying guests or whatever for it to fail when there are exhibitions at, or, or expos or or you know shows that are surviving and thriving I so mean, uh, I, I think i think with e3 they would have to go back and figure out what that is it, it would be difficult for them to do but i think if they are going to survive if they are going to have a future if they are going to come back which I don't see happening, they would I don't have to either. do that. I don't either. I think, I think if there's a space in that market to be filled, like, like what I nostalgically miss about the way I consume content, if that is a dead space that people legitimately see, there are gaming-specific conventions that can fill that and become that, without reviving e3 i don't think e3 does the work to come back it's sad from a nostalgic standpoint but i really don't see it happening mm -hmm. um i mean you're right the evaluation could happen they could find a way but i think the easy answer is covid happened then we lost our numbers then we couldn't charge the draw and it just killed us and that's the company's easy answer and why do you fight through it? Because it takes time, money, and energy to fight through something that you don't know how to save yet. So I think a different convention, and I don't know which convention, you probably have a better pulse on what convention could replace that ultimate premier convention in the gaming announcement space. But I think a convention has an opportunity there. I just don't I'll, know which one would most likely be it. I'll be honest with... The way that conventions are, the biggest one I went to is EGX, right? That's a big convention, but it's not that right. massive. And one thing that I, I enjoyed was more than I enjoyed EGX, and it's because a lot it was more indie focused, right? It was there right. were a couple Bandai Namco were the sponsors of it, they had a bigger space, but there was more chance of actually getting hands on with the games, uh, more people to talk to. There was with with EGX, it felt like there was a lot of space that was underutilized. G Fuel had a huge space just to sell their powder. Right. Then next to them was TikTok. And you're like, well, why is TikTok here? And they were just there to Doesn't exist. Make sense. And they had a <laughs> massive they didn't fit the space. <laughs> they, 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 their booth was like massive in comparison to others. Right. Well, you have to there have was, room to make the TikToks. The two biggest, well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but the, like, there wasn't anything that you could really do. Like, they had like a, a kind of like motorbike light cycle thing there. But they would have been cool. Like when I was a uh, uh, summer in the city, which is YouTube, and they had a whole stage, right, which was interactive, where it'd like do rain and snow and like simulate sunshine. You had loads of props, and that would have been cool to see. But there really wasn't that. Um, the the two biggest things that were being shown was Modern Warfare 2, which, you know, they're, they're boxed off and they've got a curtain. You have to queue up for them. The queues are ridiculously long. And House Flipper 2. Those were the two biggest, um, two biggest stalls. You had a really tiny bit at the back for VR. Next to that was a slightly bigger, but still very small section for Indie. And then, like, what batted about were a couple, you know, some some stalls for, you know, f like for 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 other kind of developers and publishers. But it, it was it felt very disjointed, and it felt like a lot of space was being used for not much. 
you know right. and then like if if you wanted to get something tangible you know like uh i don't know hands-on a good like shopping bag, experience yeah shopping. They, okay. i didn't get a single a single gift bag there you know um what a snub oh my god usually there's a lot of it. i came up with quite a bit of stuff from us no, no, like, no. no goodies oh my god <laughs> um there was a career bits in the corner but that was again quite small no one was really in there uh, there were some stages, but again, not as utilized as it was. Now, I was only there for one of this, so it could have changed, but you can walk around it in half a day. And if you, if you just wanted to kind of like get on a couple of little, you know, a couple of games and there wasn't the space in my opinion. Oh, the shopping thing. I was going to say the shopping thing. It was mostly body pillows and Funko Pops. Uh, <laughs> no, yes. that was it that yeah. was what was mostly there and it's that thing of like well it feels like if you're paying for a weekend ticket if you're industry it makes sense because you you can talk to different people when it's a little bit quieter or you know you can really get to understand it but if i was a paying if i was paying general consumer for a, for a weekend i would really have to ask myself what value am i getting from and I think that's something that conventions in general need to ask themselves is right. what, what value the value are... add. Yeah. But when, again, like Modern Warfare 2 was released on beta two days after that event. And there was right. people queuing up, absolutely queuing up for the, uh, for that booth. Um, like it was, it was double backing on itself. And I think each person probably got about 10 to 15 minutes worth of play time on it doesn't seem like a lot of time to kind of really get your your head down on it now i think no i mean expanding that there's there's a lot of things that you can do you know there's workshops that you could hold there's there's tech companies that you could invite in there's esports tournaments that people could you know that people could support or take part right. in there's a lot of things that could be done that i feel like aren't done and i think if e3 are going to go the way of the dodo or don't want to go the way of the dodo that's those are the kind of things that they need to, they need to diversify what they're doing and change the way they deliver the product to the customer essentially ask, yeah essentially ask themselves what isn't being delivered or what can't be delivered in a digital space yeah and so i mean that's a solid question about all of it when you say what can't be delivered in a digital space I mean, to answer that question, you have to look at, so for like the two of you, what video game news do you consume and how do you consume it? And like, for me, this answer has changed wildly because of what I'm doing both here on the podcast and with my YouTube stuff. Like I have changed the way I consume video game news wildly in the last like month. But how do you guys, what do you consider industry news in the gaming space that you consume? And how do you typically consume that right now? I mean, oh. I, I, I don't like, <laughs> I, I'm very much like anti consume next product, do next thing, need next thing. I, that's not how I live. I find my favorite stuff and then like, I'll casually discover like kind of unique gems, but I don't I don't play AAA games anymore at all. Like I haven't played a Call of Duty in probably a decade. I right. just, it's not my so, jam. So I'm hanging out my channel is probably the most news you've ever gotten about video games, and you're completely okay with it. You don't want it. Yeah, pretty much. I I don't need the AAA news because if I hear about a new game that comes out, I'll go on Twitch and I'll go watch how it runs for someone else and like how it looks and. <laughs> Generally, I'll be pretty unimpressed and go back to doing whatever I'm doing. I mean, so that is an argument for the direct consumer. You're more concerned about kind of to my point a while ago where in the gaming space, you want to hear from a gamer about a game to see if it's worth your time. So you will always wait for people within the community that that game has to experience it that way, then try to find it from any other source. Yeah, no, um, any sort of video game journalism I really don't trust because there's always been so much payment from video games or 
developers or publishers to give positive reviews that I just, I don't trust video game news. It's not worth listening to, to me. Fair. I'll shadow that and, and agree. Mine obviously is going to be a bit different, especially in the last month or two. Um, because obviously for very there's, different there's... reasons, but like you also have a giant shift in how involved you are in the game industry the last month or so. Yeah, so you know, there, there's a lot of industry sites that I read now. Um, there's LinkedIn, <laughs> which is direct to developer. Um, there are also a lot of articles that I'll see on Twitter or they'll pop up on my feeds, which I'll read through. You know, I'll consume YouTube kind of reviews and YouTube news. But much like Barbaric, I will take everything with a pinch of salt. And generally, if there's something that I'm interested in or something I want to see, I will go onto somebody's stream and see how it is directly. Because I think one of the things that we spoke about during the Game Awards was like, if there's a new game and they're showing a trailer, it's going to be a cinematic for the, I'm going to say... Seven out of ten, eight out of ten times. And, and if I, not, it's going to be a vertical slice. That's not right. going to match the end product. Yeah. And, and I've been burnt before. You know, I've been hurt before. So Fool me I, once, shame on you, right? <laughs> exactly. So I, I like to take that, take those, those, I don't take anything I read or see as gospel until I've had a good... I guess, uh, view of it from multiple different sources and platforms. Right. Because, you know, what might not do it for you might do it for me. You might think certain mechanics in this game are, are pretty terrible, but I might have really enjoyed my experience, you know? So a review yeah. from a, a critic or a YouTuber or, I don't know, zero punctuation, you know, it's going it, to, that might, it, some people, it might shape their opinion of the game. Um, I remember actually a, a close friend of mine, I said to him, yeah, then you, you know, t- talk because I, you know, I'm talking about COD a lot, but I think it's just because it is a touchstone for uh, the larger industry being one of the biggest games to exist at the right. moment. I mean, indeed, ever. It's a cornerstone um, game. Yeah. It probably has one of the largest audiences. Loved sure. the first one. I said, Are you going to get it? And he said, No, I don't want to get it. X, Y, and Z. And taking the, you know, taking the, um, the word of others is kind of gospel, I guess, from what they've heard. And now they love it, you know? And yeah. so it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, where does, where does that opinion start and where does it end? Was I, for me, I'll just rather go, I will, you know, I'll have a look at it. I'll, I, I want, again, going back to your talk about beta, like I was able to play the beta and I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, actually, this is a lot of fun. I'm enjoying this. Play the beta. And that's what made, gave me the decision to play the game uh, or buy right. the game. This talk of Jedi Survivor, I've heard so many different things. I've read the articles, I've seen the videos, but then I've also seen people's streams, you know, and I've had people come into chat and they've said it's been absolutely fine, even on a, yeah. even on a, um, a comparable or exact card that I may have. So well, that's always one of those, like, there's two things that go hand in hand with all of it, especially in reviews is one, there's no accounting for taste and in the gaming, especially in PC gaming, some experiences may differ. Like, when you play a game, and I play a game, our computers are going to handle that completely different. Computers mm-hmm. are temperamental. They're all extremely different, and you never know what experience you're going to get. But th- those are two massive issues. Like, when you say accounting for taste, like... I could love a mechanic and you could hate a mechanic and there's no telling what that's going to play out like because individual taste is exactly that individual in the gaming space. Games are going to play different because they are different and you're on different rigs. Your computer's processing this different information. So that's a real serious thing to consider. And when it comes to like consuming news for me, like, because I've wanted to be, I don't even want to be a YouTuber that gives you the exact detailed news down to the letter. I want to be the guy that just sparks a conversation by discussing something that happened. So I want to give you headlines and stuff that I've read that pique my interest. And I just want 
to give you something to think on or for you to come up with your own opinion on. Mm-hmm. So, like, I think that's a really big thing in news development. But in order to do that, I have to read a lot of articles. And a lot of articles end up sounding a lot alike from different companies. Like, they start parroting each other very frequently in gamer news. And until it gets down to me, the guy who's trying to make it more of an opinion to make you think, or the streamer who knows about this game and loves this franchise who gives his opinion, until it gets to that level, you're going to get a lot of that parroted news and people have to start splitting off and forming opinions based on that, if that makes sense. And I think that is the future of gaming news, where you're going to have the companies that put out the information but until it starts getting broken down into opinions by by streamers or by friends that you game with, it's not really going to take hold or you're not going to have a decision on. I mean, I think that's the present. I know you're saying, you know, it's going to continue, but, you know, we, that's what we're in at the moment. Um, I think that as humans, we gravitate, gra- gravitate to headlines generally. That's just the way that our psychology works. Um, and so I don't feel like that's going to change regardless of whether it's print media, a digital publication, but but you will have the barbarics that, you know, they won't trust it because they know how it's formed. Yeah. It'll never go away, but people are going to be very skeptical. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think that the, the more instances we have, especially of larger games, because they are the cornerstone, they are the example leading the charge. The more the more that we have um, these these issues or these kind of headlines, get yeah, a survivor and he's twelve gigs of RAM and a forty ninety or struggles to play on a forty ninety to play or Cyberpunk, so many years in development, glitchy as hell. You know, there's a lot of games in between that that have have done very well. You know, yeah, incredibly well, and still right. up the ante. Again, the negative is always going to outshine the positive, you know. More oh, people leave sure. negative reviews and, than positive reviews. And but even th- with that, people put on rose-colored glasses to the early 2000s and the glitches that existed back then. So, like... Yeah. It's the reason speedruns exist. <laughs> glitch glitch speedruns. There's so many yeah. of them. I don't think it's ever going to... There'll always be a space for that, obviously. But I think that until... It's a shared thing. Quality assurance needs to be needs needs to be a benchmark that I feel like isn't being followed right now. But also to to echo uh, Hilo's point about you know paying with your pocket or paying with your pocket, whatever the phrase is. I I'm bad at phrases. All you right, vote with your pocket. Vote with your pocket. Thank you. You know it it it, it it's not going to change anything. And I think that yeah. there's that there's always going to be a sentiment of of resistance, but that it's always going to come from the very top, you know. And you're always going to have flops. But I think the problem is, it's they, these these games aren't flops for the sake of the game being bad. It's generally from issues with the game itself. And I right. do give them the benefit of the doubt because there is the technology has moved on so quickly in such a short space of time. From the start of the development of a game to release, there is so much that has changed. You know, these games don't yeah. take a day to make. You can't, you know, they're they're consistently updating, constantly rewriting. You know, for example, the game I'm working on, move. It's not a huge amount of of difference within the engines, but you do have to do a lot of work to renegotiate a lot of the fidelity, the graphics. Right, um, you have to retest assets and. Like you have to make work. sure it lines up correctly. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the coding like may, Yeah, there are benefits in optimization and, and again graphical fidelity that that come with boosting an engine, you know, and long term. But it doesn't mean that you know, like I think wasn't it seven days changed changed engines? I mean, they've been in early access for ten years. I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah, um, but. I, I think I think there's there's a lot. It's it's a much more in depth and complicated answer than just like game company bad, players great, or players salty, salty little gremlins, and game developers no more. It there's a lot more nuance. Um, uh, yeah, and I feel it's... like 
I feel like also a, a lot of it has to do with how fast hardware has grown in the past few years. It's, it's a reason why we're seeing a lot of this uptick. You know, optimization on Jedi, that could have been better, but <laughs> to be honest, the, the speed in which they probably got it out, they probably had a release date and they have to stick to that, you know? Right. For, for many different reasons. Understandable. I think at the end of the day, I... I am excited that development news and project news and things like that are coming out on a steady basis. I appreciate that the information gets released as game developers want and they don't wait for like one time a year. I will always miss that consolidated style, even though... Mm like you pointed out with the game awards things will take that place and we'll try to bridge that gap because there there will be a slight gap in that regard now Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of advantages to the way that news is being delivered and the gaming space gives information to the consumers and for me nostalgia will always be a thing but just because something dies doesn't mean we're not going to a better way of information development and delivery. And it's more consistent. It is also more that. consistent. You you do get to spend more time throughout the day or throughout the year. Like you don't have to wait for one or two times a year. You do get or that like consistent a, month, drip, a monthly magazine, a drip, you know, or a monthly magazine. Like when something happens, it happens in days gone past. When, you know, Bethesda made the mistake of copyright striking their product, Redfall, and and they made that mistake. In days past, we would have to wait until next month's it- issue of Game Informer to get that news. But now, I get to do a story on it the next day because it's funny and I saw it because I read the online publications that are readily available. Yeah. Barbaric, have you, have you got any thoughts? No, like I said, I don't. I don't really don't keep up with gaming news anymore. I'm burned out on it. Burned out on it. Well, barbaric. I appreciate you hanging out with me when you do consume that oh, yeah. news, and, and I understand you don't have as many opinions on that. But I think that also kind of creates the point as well, right? There are some yeah. people who are just kind of burnt out with it, and and right. There I is mean, so I much that is that is readily available that it's not as breathtaking like you might get you know like e3 yeah to to the to the positive point about it that was a time where you could oh my god look at this because that was the only time that you'd get that news god Whereas so now, much of just... it was a tidal wave and it was overwhelming but then there'd be droughts now it's just the, the drip, drip, drip yeah drip. now it's the flood i don't know i love news and i love where i'm at in my like gaming world journey keeping up on it and i think there's a lot to look forward to i don't know i just i think that like everything else that this space has been pushed more and more digital and covid amplified it because you were no longer able to have those massive conventions and at the end of the day us as gamers are going to get more news more consistently and it's going to be fun it may be a little bit harder and less consolidated which take it as you will but at the end of the day that communication and information development is just more consistent and you take what you get the industry everything evolves this is the new standard until something else replaces it things will always evolve and march forward i guess we'd love to hear Mm -hmm. your thoughts down in the comments let us know what you think And thank you for hanging out. And hopefully we can bring you more gaming news, entertainment topics, just as food for thought and scene (laughs) question mark. (laughs) If you don't, if you don't include the and scene bit, I'm going to be mad. (laughs) Okay. Well, and scene is now the new ending words of everyone. Yep. (laughs) That's the new sign off.